So are software developers doomed? Is it even worth learning to code in 2023 since ChatGPT can solve some leak code problems? And the answer is no. ChatGPT and LLMs do not keep me up at night. I'm not concerned about them. And in this video, I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of history and I'm gonna tell you why anyone who predicts the death of anything in technology is usually wrong. And then I'm going to go into some of the positions and some of the skills that I do think are going to be threatened by AI because our field is going to change a bit over the next couple of years. I'm Eric Wise from Skill Foundry, where we teach people how to code the right way. Now let's go back in time. Let's start in 1959. There was a language that was created and launched called COBOL the common business-oriented language. Now, this language came out to great fanfare and great hype. It was going to simplify development. You were going to need less skilled developers and making software would be easier. And a lot of those things were true. But what happened when the barrier to entry to writing code became lower is that the demand for software increased. But that didn't stop the naysayers for calling for the death of COBOL. They started saying that COBOL was dying a couple years after it was launched. And one gentleman at some point even created a tombstone. He paid to commission a physical tombstone with the word COBOL on it and sent it to one of the COBOL supporters in the community spent that much money and that much time and effort just to say that a language was dying. Now, is COBOL dying? Not really. As of 2017, IBM reported that 92 of the top 100 banks still have COBOL and mainframe applications in their stack. COBOL has been dying for 60 years. And in fact, if you are a consultant, and you are a gig developer and you're looking for something that will pay you well and be relatively stable and secure, COBOL is a great language to learn. And that's because the original developers of a lot of this software are either retired or literally dead of old age. There is demand and these systems need to be updated and maintained and there aren't enough people to do it. So if a language as old as COBOL is still around and still relevant, how can you put a lot of stock in somebody who says something like, oh, Java is dying or oh, SQL is dying? Well, I got news for you. Java is the COBOL of our time. It may not be super sexy. It may not be very popular among young people, but just like COBOL, there is so much critical infrastructure and applications that have been built in it that it's just not feasible to replace it. It's not cost effective and it's not valuable as far as adding features or anything useful. So these things are going to be around for a long time. So anytime somebody calls for the death of anything in tech, you should have one eyebrow raised because usually they're wrong. And besides the fact that these languages don't go away, we've also seen incredible productivity increases over time. I mean, I started learning to code before there was an internet connection in my house. It just wasn't a thing back then. And I remember going to the bookstore and buying a C reference guide that was almost as thick as my head. And I would have to open that book and I would have to read and look at samples and try to put that into my coding projects. And inevitably, it didn't have the solution I was looking for. And I had to do a lot of experimenting and a lot of trial and error just to get things done. And then you fast forward to today and we have modern IDEs, we have autocomplete, we have ChatGPT, we have all these tools that have made software development more productive. I am many times faster at writing code than I used to be just because of the tools. But that hasn't decreased the demand for developers at all. Again, the trend has been 
as the barrier to entry lowers and as developers become more productive, the world demands more software. Are you driving a car or a computer these days? Your fridges, they have fridges now with touchscreens on them that have application interfaces that can order your groceries. This stuff just keeps expanding and growing. So the need for software developers has continued to increase in spite of rapid advances in productivity and lowering the barriers to entry. And I see no reason why that won't continue. The world is just becoming more connected every time we have these advancements. Now, another thing this makes me think about when people start talking about ChatGPT replacing developers is back in the 2000s, we kind of tried to do this with offshoring. And the whole point about offshoring is American developers, developers in the top economies are not cheap. They're very expensive. And back in the 2000s, some companies said, hey, the internet is good enough now and telecommunication software is a thing. Why don't we get rid of all these expensive local developers and we'll just offshore our work to someplace cheaper like Southeast Asia or India where you can hire four or five developers for one American. And all the big consultancies started helping companies do this. And there was this big trend. And in the American market, at least, there was all this doom and gloom. Like, oh, you shouldn't go into software development because they're just going to ship your job to Southeast Asia. You're going to be competing globally and you're just not going to be able to command the rates that you do today. And it's just it's not worth going into this field. And for a while enrollment in computer science and enrollment in learning to code dropped because of this fear. Well, what did we learn? Well, we learned that these companies that wanted to offshore all this stuff, that they couldn't communicate well enough with the offshore developers. They couldn't write good enough specs. They didn't know enough about technology to manage the software process appropriately. So a lot of these offshore projects, they outright failed. They went over costs, they went over budget, they went over time, and it was just a big crap show. Now today, the globalization has happened and companies have kind of figured out that if they want to do offshore development, they need to really invest in that and really invest in that infrastructure, which is not cheap or easy. So that whole threat of small and medium businesses just offshoring all their stuff overseas and not needing American developers anymore, it was all BS. Now, what does this have to do with LLMs? Well, I can tell you, if I woke up tomorrow morning and ChatGPT could write mid or senior level code, I wouldn't panic at all because you would have the same thing with ChatGPT as you had with these offshore development shops you would need people who could manage it, QA it, validate it, give it proper specs for it to be effective. And you need to be a technical person to do that. So again, even if tomorrow things changed and it could write all of the code for me or 90% of the code for me, I would still feel confident that somebody who knows what they're doing and understands coding would still need to be the one to communicate with it. Now let's talk about some changes. You know, ChatGPT has changed how I approach coding and, and how I approach my business. So first off, ChatGPT is really, really good at boilerplate code and code that has a lot of solutions out there. Like people initially started panicking because ChatGPT could solve a lot of leak code problems. Well, yeah, the way ChatGPT works, because it doesn't think, it's predictive analysis, the more data you have around a solution or a problem set, the better the answer is going to be. So I'm not, I was never super surprised that ChatGPT did good at leak code type challenges. And this is where some players in the space should be concerned. If you look at Stack Overflow, this was one of the top developer communities for getting answers. Their stock has cratered lately. And it's because of ChatGPT. I can't even tell you the last time I've gone to Stack Overflow. 
In software development, there are a lot of things that are solved problems that you don't use very often, like configuring a database connection. There is something called a connection string. It has information about how to connect to the database, like where the database server is, what the name of the database is you want to connect to, what kind of credentials you want to use. And there is a specific format for creating a connection string. I don't have that memorized because I reach for it once, I create the connection string, I throw it in my secure secrets area in my application, and then I don't think about it ever again. With ChatGPT and other tools, I can just say, hey, give me the format for a connection string. And it just gives me that template. Or if I need to read or write data to a file, I can be like, hey, give me a sample of writing data to a file. And it will give me the structured skeleton of how that works. So ChatGPT in my workflow has replaced Google and has replaced Stack Overflow as the first place I go because it gets me right to the code. I don't have to click through multiple links. I don't have to read parts of each link and figure out if this is up to date or if this is deprecated knowledge. And I don't have to dig through Stack Overflow and look for the green check mark. It just speeds me up because it gets me answers quicker and I can more quickly try them out and see if it's what I'm really looking for. So if you're a business that relies on ads or eyeballs or people physically going to your site to get some of this information, I would be concerned because ChatGPT has definitely evolved the way I do that. Now, the other place where I would have some concerns for tech workers specifically is in the more front end design type roles. ChatGPT being really good at templates and a lot of websites and application interfaces being templatized with things like Bootstrap, Tailwind, Material CS, all of those things, those are definitely targets where ChatGPT could start doing a lot of the work for you. And I've used it a little bit for this. I've played around with it. It's not quite there. It still gets things wrong. It doesn't understand visibility very well. It doesn't understand some of the dynamic shifts very well. But I think that's something over the next couple of years it's going to get very good at. Now, does that really scare me if I'm a front end developer, designer type person? I mean, not really. I mean, when I was building my boot camp 10 years ago, I wrote my entire website by hand. I mean, I wrote all the HTML, all the CSS. I did use some CSS templates and things that I purchased from designer people, but I did most of the work myself. And if you fast forward to today, there's sites like Wix and, you know, skillfoundry.io where I'm hosting my course content. They have a really good site builder at my host. And I ended up not writing any custom HTML and only a little bit of custom CSS. So this has been going on for a while now, but there's still a need for front end developers and front end designers. The question is, how much is that going to change? And I would say that the more of your work that is easily templated and falls into standard CSS frameworks like Tailwind or Bootstrap, the more you should be concerned if that's a core part of your job, because those are going to be the first things that ChatGPT and these LLMs are going to start improving the productivity on. Now, if you're a contractor, if you're a gig worker, you should be excited about this because usually what happens when these tools get better and you get more productive, that just means that you can do the same work faster and you can have more clients, which usually means you can make more money. So very quickly, two other careers in IT that I think I'd have one eyebrow raised if it were me would be a low level data analyst. If you're doing very simple data querying and transformation and creating reports and charts and graphs, I would definitely have one eyebrow raised. Uh, those kind of simple templated things are an easy target for what's coming with the LLMs. I would definitely be shifting more into learning how to train those models, building more advanced visualizations, or even helping out and getting skill sets in data engineering and data cleansing and kind of taking care of the data 
that the LLMs are going to use to generate those reports. So I would try to move one step further towards the back end if I were a low level kind of forward facing data analyst. The other one is cybersecurity analyst. There are a lot of cybersecurity roles that involve a lot of monitoring. And this monitoring is looking for patterns, looking for blips, looking for glitches. Machine learning and AI is going to be infinitely better at that than you are. You should be moving deeper into the cybersecurity stack and learning what to do when those things are detected and how to set up systems. Like I would be learning secure coding if I was had some developer skills and I was a cybersecurity analyst. I would be learning a lot more about cloud and DevOps and configuration and things like that. If your job is just monitoring things, I would have both eyebrows raised because that is something that you will just never be able to compete with a machine doing. But bottom line, where I would be concerned in general is just anything that is templated, repeatable, doesn't deviate from the pattern very much because that's the stuff that these LLMs are really good at. There's a lot of custom code out there. There's a lot of custom situations, especially when it comes to things like performance optimization, security. I mean, there's no way the current LLMs can go into an enterprise that has several million lines of code and be effective across the whole stack. It can be targeted and be effective at a small target with guidance, but we are a long way away from producing those types of applications with those many features at scale that work together. So again, not concerned, ChatGPT not keeping me up at night. And again, even if it does get to the point where it's good at that stuff, you're still going to need human architects to collaborate with it and tell it what to do. But we're a long way from that. So my advice is to continue to just calm down. There's plenty of developer positions out there. Even though we are in a downturn right now in 2023, this is not a good time to be looking for entry level jobs or jobs in general because we had all the layoffs. Now we're in kind of the trough where companies are deciding whether they want to hire. But I am seeing statistics reports that it is starting to pick up and I'm sticking with my prediction that, you know, probably somewhere around Q2 of 2024 we're gonna start returning to normal. Because in spite of all the gloom and doom that's getting clicks, we're still in unemployment percentages below the general population in IT. We still have more IT workers employed than we did before the pandemic. So a lot of this doom and gloom, it's overhyped. We were due for a correction. We get one almost every eight to 10 years. And then we have these same conversations like, oh, is it the end? Is the gravy train over? No, it's not. We're going to be fine. Just wait it out. Economic cycles impact IT workers too. You know, we were just due. So otherwise, you know, keep learning, keep cracking away, be patient, learn slow, learn deep, try to differentiate yourself from other people with the skills that are less common. I keep preaching that the MERN stack in the JavaScript, it's so oversaturated right now. If you're learning to code, just please start somewhere else. You know, Python, Java, C Sharp, C++. There's a lot of different other valid entry points that aren't pure front end web developer because that is by far going to be your hardest path to learn and get into the professional field in 2023 and probably later into 2024 because there is such an oversaturation of those skills. So either way, I hope I made you feel better. I'm not worried about ChatGPT. It's my friend. It's kind of a stupid friend sometimes. It doesn't always do what I want, but it has definitely changed the way I worked and it's increased my productivity. But again, productivity increases have happened throughout the history of programming. And here we are today, we have more developers than ever, more software than ever. And it's going to take a lot to convince me that this is going to be any different. Happy coding.